Archer Mayer. Archer has a, a rather brief bio in his uh, novels, and it really says not much about what Archer Mayer does. Uh, and Archer's a writer, obviously, uh, a medical examiner, uh, a researcher, a forensic scientist, an EMT, a firefighter, a town moderator, a hospital board member, um, former owner of a tortoise, and uh, a lot of other things. Indeed. You know, and I guess we could say, Archer, you're, you're a mile wide and 10 miles deep. <laughs> or, you know, jack of all trades, master of most. Um, so I got to ask a question. Are you Joe Gunther? Good God, no. Joe Gunther is such a much more decent man than I. Uh, I admire and respect Joe Gunther. Um, I would like to emulate Mr. Gunther whenever possible. But I usually screw that up within the first five minutes of uh, said ambition. Um, to live one's life as Joe Gunther uh, would be a magnificent thing, as I see it. Uh, he is thoughtful, avuncular, helpful, a team player, uh, and on and on and on. Uh, if he were a standalone character, not surrounded by the other characters I've conjured up, he possibly could be considered the most boring man on earth. Uh, but, uh, but I, I set out to create Elliot a decent man. And that's why I gave him the world's most boring name, Joe Gunther. Uh, I created that name so that it would lie on the floor and not move, not twitch. Uh, it would have to be a name that you would find almost in every phone book in the United States. Um, and the point was quite simple, to build a series around a hardworking, thoughtful, caring everyman, who, of course, by having all those attributes, was extraordinary <laughs> and very rare and highly blessed to have in one's company. Okay. So if you're not Joe Gunther, who are you? <laughs> I'm much more Willie Kunkel. <laughs> I've been told this by reliable source, my daughter, who knows me all too well. Uh, and uh, she's right. Uh, I am complicated, uh, driven by demons, uh, diagnosed PTSD, if you want to get into the gory details. Uh, I have a fundamental darkness in my soul, uh, and I have struggled my entire life to turn these to good effect. So I keep busy. I try to keep engaged. I try to be helpful. I try to uh, either volunteer or to work outright uh, to the betterment of my fellow human being. I try to sol problem solve with people. I try to be um, uh, a constructive voice in any room. And it all comes at a cost because in a funny kind of way, and I think this is shared by most people, I am made of two personalities, the inner and the outer. Uh, and, and, you know, we all walk around or drive around alone in our cars, cursing at other people. Uh, and yet when we get out of that car and we engage with them face to face, then we transform into other human beings. This insight, this hard earned uh, glimpse of what makes me a complicated three dimensional human being is what I try to project uh, into my books. I use Joe Gunther almost as a caricature to gain conduit to the Willie Kunkels and half a dozen other characters that I regularly portray in these books. Uh, and my, my efforts are to create not murder mysteries. I actually don't care much about murder mysteries, but I am fascinated with cultural anthropology, with human psychology, uh, and, uh, and other murky aspects of our species.
Rather, rather interesting since uh, my understanding is you're a graduate of the uh, same illustrious university as a couple of our presidents. Uh, yes. <laughs> who were about the same age as we are. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Yes, I was, uh, I think, a, a year or so behind George Bush. And uh, yeah, yeah. And the Clintons were across the street and up the road a little ways when I was there. And the list goes on. Uh, it's always, uh, always amusing to me when people run, uh, oh, you, you went to Yale University. And I said, so, do I, so did a lot of people. <laughs> 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 Beware of the book's cover. <laughs> You began the writing part of your career, the Joe Gunther part, um, almost, uh, well, over 30 years ago, right? Oh, yeah. And uh, at an age when most people are settling into the career that they started 10 years before. <laughs> and you know, the, uh, they're midway through their career. You're starting a career. Was was this a, an effort basically to uh, address a midlife crisis or what what led you to Joe? I think I was born a midlife crisis. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I got the I, I got a jump on the competition. Um, you know, the last time I was fully employed, uh, in other words, the golden parachute and the and all that the W this and W that the people refer to that I look at them kind of quizzically. Uh, that was in 1978. Uh, and I was sitting around a, a, a fake wooden table with a bunch of other people, uh, all wearing ties and pretending we were grown ups. And uh, I realized I could probably be as dumb as everybody was being cumulatively around that table all by myself. Uh, and uh, so I quit. And that was the last time I ever uh, kept uh, that kind of uh, company, at least in an employment status. Obviously, we keep company like that all through our lives. But the point being that... Um, I am a restless soul. I am driven by ignorance and curiosity, and I can satisfy neither one of those outboard motors uh, by steady employment and anticipating the golden parachute and retiring at the age of 65, at least in the old days. So I eschewed all that. I ran the risk of steady unemployment. Uh, I became a contract worker in 1979, therefore. And I've never looked back. And all these jobs, I've been a police officer, I've been a uh, you know, firefighter, a, a rescue guy, all those lists that you rattled off, all of those jobs and more have always been by contract. So I will always work for an hourly basis or a contract basis, but um, no benefits, no retirement, no you know, security. Uh, I want to have that option just just kind of like Willie would do funnily enough which is to say you know what uh, I'm not having a good time you're not satisfying my ignorance uh, or my curiosity and I'm out of here and I have done that uh, now the writing is my conduit uh, when I was a cop for example uh, my specialty was sex crimes against kids so for year and year I'm keeping shall we say poor company so what do you do with that? Um, you know, you're interviewing three-year-old children and asking them about inappropriate touching. Uh, and the days go on and the years go on. Uh, what do normal people do with this kind of employment and this kind of burden? Because you got to put that some stuff somewhere. You don't just forget about it at the end of the minute. Uh, well, I have my writing. I have Joe Gunther. I have Willie Kunkel. I have an investigative team whose cases I can invent. Uh, and on any given year, because I write a book a year, uh, I can channel what may be bugging me or interesting me or uh, catching my attention in some way or another. Uh, and, and this is how I've chosen to to balance the devils in my head 
and the ambitions in my heart. So you've kind of, I guess, moved forward or sideways or whatever through life. How has Joe changed? Not much. That's the funny thing. Uh, if you create a character based on principle, you've immediately decided that although you will give him a background and you will give him relationships and whatnot, you've created uh, a vessel, a conduit uh, to uh, human discoveries and, and other uh, uh, items of interest. And I, I don't want it clot up or plug up that conduit with too much about Joe. Joe is a, either a mirror or, as I said, a, a tunnel that leads us somewhere or reflects something. Uh, but to make it all about Joe is to miss the whole point of my exercise, which is to bring my readers into my writing as participants. I want them to read about my characters and their activities and go, oh, I know what he's talking about. I know people like this. I've been in this world. Uh, it's like, yeah, reading one of the novels is almost like looking over Joe's shoulder. Yes. As he's going through it. And you're, you're looking at the personalities, characters, and motivations of others, as opposed to the guy you're, you're kind of leaning on as you go through. Precisely. Precisely. Now, I, I need people to come to Joe and address Joe as a human being. So, he, you know, he has a girlfriend and, and he has, a, you know, emotional problems. He has run-ins. He has a cat. You know, he, he does real person stuff. Uh, but we don't get all filled up uh, like a soap opera might offer. Uh, and there's no oxygen in the room. I want a lot of oxygen. I, I, you know, it, it's important for me for this to always be a kind of, and this is a paradox of, of sorts, a collaborative process between me and the reader. I want the reader's imagination and, and, uh, uh, and uh, to, to be uh, participatory. Now, you, you've obviously made a, a clear choice in the writings to uh, set the scene in rural Vermont. You live in about as rural Vermont as, uh, you know, Newfane, Vermont isn't exactly a metropolis, uh, <laughs> except for when there's a seasonal uh, celebration or something, and then every tourist in Vermont ends up in right. uh, Newfane. But... Um, What's the hook for somebody who uh, lives in an urban or suburban environment to Joe? Is it that character that Joe's looking at that would draw them? I, you know, and I also, you know, being a, a lifelong Vermonter, basically, you know, and knowing the places that you're describing in Vermont, it's like, okay, there's a very natural draw for me. Yeah. Because when you're writing about the old north end of Burlington, where I grew up, you're writing about the old north end of Burlington. <laughs> I can right. see it. Right. Uh, right. So there's, there's a good connection for me. But if I lived in a high rise in Brooklyn, uh, how would you want me to, to see what you write? Two ways. One would be uh, the attraction of the exotic. So if you are reading from Brooklyn, you have certainly heard of Vermont. Now, one could say that the crafty aspect, the commercial aspect of my brain went, I'll write about Vermont because at least everybody has heard of Vermont. Okay, they may, they may have also heard of Iowa, but they don't even know where it is on the map and they know nothing about it. But Vermont, they think they know something about it. 
You know, they know about cows, they know about maple syrup, they know about skiers, they know about most of the things that's of no interest to we Vermonters, but but they know Vermont. So I thought, okay, let's first of all put it in a place where everyone goes, yeah, I've heard of that place before. Now, the second thing is that, yes, they, they're reading this thing in Haight-Ashbury or, or Brooklyn or, or Memphis or wherever they are, and maybe they're in their apartment and maybe that building spill out of brick and maybe there's an alleyway, you know, two blocks away. Well, such as it is the old North End, brick buildings, alleyways, apartments, we are what we are, regardless uh, of where we happen to be living. So I can tap into the familiar, such as garbage cans being rattled at you know three in the morning, and I can then uh, bring the reader over to the exotic, which is, oh my God, he, he, yeah, he's writing about Vermont, but he hasn't once mentioned maple syrup or cow. <laughs> <laughs> you know? He's talking about drug dealers and prostitutes and the down and out and murderers and and the disadvantaged and the poor and the people who are trying to make ends meet one way or the other who happen to reside in Vermont. Well, guess what? You know, yeah, Vermont may not be all that particularly different from uh, right around the corner in Brooklyn. Now, you know, each of the books in the Joe Gunther series stands alone. Yes. Uh, it's a series, not a serial. And is that um, by design? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. On, on, two, on two levels, again. One is that if you're a writer, you're an idiot if you think that all your books are going to survive. I'm an idiot and all my books do survive. So, <laughs> you know, I got lucky. <laughs> but, but in a way, uh, that's because uh, I also applied an instinctive business uh, uh, personality, which is that as my books went out of print, uh, I got them back. So this series right now has 31 books out in bookstores, and I'm just I'm editing the 31st, 32nd uh, on my computer as we speak, and it'll be out next fall. But 17 to 18 of those books went out of print. I got them back and brought them back into print under my imprint. I own them. So this is what a writer who wants to be a full-time self-employed writer needs to do is that you need to, okay, write the books. Yeah, that's fine. But you also need to manage those books. You need to run a business. And on that level, you need to be responsible for absolutely everything you can imagine. Um, you know, handling, shipping, and, uh, and all the rest of it. Uh, so uh, when you have that outlook, you look at your books, yes, on the artistic side, and for all the stuff that we've been touching on, but also on, uh, okay, is this book going to always be available? Well, early on in my career, I had no, you know, justification to think that my New York publisher was going to keep me in print. So if I wrote a serial, as you uh, pointed out, different than a series, uh, then I'd be screwed because when I referred to, well, remember the Hardy Boys uh, mystery number three, well, it wasn't available anymore. So forget about that. Let's do away with all those kind of references uh, and assume that my books are going to be put out of print, which they tried to do, but they didn't succeed. So the second aspect to that, answering that question, is less hardware, more touchy-feely, and it has to do with the stuff that we touched on earlier, which is that I want to write these books about things I know little about. I want to educate myself via the research, via the introspective action of writing them, uh, and then I want to share those with my readers. Well, if I was, I'm, I mean, I'm already stuck with my own voice. I'm in effect stuck with Joe Gunther and Willie Kunkel and these other characters we've alluded to. I don't want to become predictable. I don't want my readers to tell me after the fact, oh, you know what, you're running out of gas. So I would sooner run the risk of failure by writing a standalone novel in a series of books 
and and screw up than I would just sort of because someone said, oh, wow, well, that last book was great. Just keep writing that book. We'll only change a few names now and then. If I did that, uh, I don't think we'd be having this conversation. But by running the risk of failure, which is how you learn in my world, uh, I was brought up by a father who died at the age of 99, born in 1906. And this old man told me more than once, you never learn through your successes. So run the risk mm. of not being successful. Run the risk of picking yourself up, dusting yourself off and going, well, I better not do that again. So how do I do it differently the next time? Now, that's an energizing, stimulating way to lead your life. And it's probably part and parcel of why I stopped becoming employed by others uh, and, and set out on my own. So you've, you've kind of taken me where I wanted to go to the next, which is, do you have any other advice for uh, the folks who pick up your book and say, you know, I could do this too, and I'd love to write. Uh, they could be young writers. They could be 40-year-olds looking for something to, to anchor themselves in. What's your message to them? My, my message, and this is a... a or they a, could be a 72-year-old oh, yeah. who's interviewing an author. Sure. Well, no, precisely right. So to that point, <laughs> um, there was a time I was invited to uh, instruct people or to teach people, uh, you know, or at least mentor them at, in writing environments. <laughs> Those times have passed. And one of the reasons that, that I jokingly refer to my erstwhile uh, career as a writing instructor, or however you want to phrase it, I obviously don't know what I'm talking about, which is because when I would enter those environments and there'd be five people sitting around a table all aspiring to be writers, I would say, thank you for your money. Now go home and make mistakes. And they'd look at me <laughs> and I'd look at them and say, that's how you learn how to write. We go back to the very point I was making. You, you got to screw up. You got to go out there. You got to stick your neck out and see if you have the sticky to -y. You know, do you have the patience? Do you have the tolerance for rejection? That's self-rejection, not the rejection of others. That's putting words to paper and doing that day after day, hour after hour, then you will realize what all these writers have been griping about when they say that the most attractive thing about writing is going for a walk or finding something else to do. You will also understand why Dashiell Hammett used to say, oh, writing is easy. You just sit down, open a vein and begin to type. You know, it, it's isolated painful work because you're stuck entirely inside your own head. There's no one to distract you. There's no one to get you off track. It's you and your muse and your responsibility to put what's in your head coherently, even artistically, put it forth. That's a bear. And the best way to do it is to just throw up on the page and edit, 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 edit. I've been doing this, as we've discussed, for a fair number of years. In fact, I've been a full-time writer because I used to write history books before I wrote these. So I actually am celebrating my 40th year as a full-time self-employed writer. In those 40 years, you'd think, just like a qualified sheetrocker, I'd be pretty goddamn good at putting up some <laughs> sheetrock. Well, I'm not bad. But you should see the book that I'm editing right now. Now, this is 300 pages. This is God knows how many books later. You cannot see the typescript. And this is the second edit we're talking about, not the first time out. It is covered with pencil marks and, and arrows. And, oh, my God, what were you thinking? And that's what you need to do. And you need to do it every single book. And it never gets easier. And that's the joy of hard work. Uh, so 
anyone who thinks, oh, well, I've led a full life, and uh, or if you're a 17 year old wonderkin, oh, you know, I got so much on my mind that people need to benefit from. I don't care what your viewpoint is. Once you get to it, hold yourself responsible to what I think is the one thing that all writers need to never forget. And that is, you're a reader first. What's it like to read your own stuff? Have you not, as a reader, as a discriminating reader, hit those points where you said, oh, for God's sake, if that's all he can say to me, I'm going to wing ding this this book across the table. You and I are of a generation where we were brought up that if you begin a book, you finish a book. Okay. I doubt that you do that. I sure don't do that anymore because now I hold writers to be a little bit more responsible than my Calvinist dictate uh, that I'm <laughs> supposed to, you know, begin what I finish. You know, if you haven't earned my respect as a writer, then I'm not going to keep you company as a reader. Well, as a writer, you need to remember that. So you need to be respectful, engaging, scintillating, and responsible as a writer. It's not easy. Archer, it has been a pleasure <laughs> talking to you. Um, your words of wisdom come to my heart. And uh, in some ways, I, I kind of... Uh, appreciate the comments about editing because as you know i have a little writing task that i do quite regularly and uh you know it starts granted it's not a 300 page book uh but for me to produce 700 words every two weeks yeah. as it's it's an editing chore, and uh, I know no, yeah, that I want to say it. My emails. <laughs> so I hear you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I greatly appreciate the time that you've uh, taken out of your day to uh, speak with me, and uh, best wishes on uh, number thirty-two. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and a joy, Elliot. Mm -hmm.